Good evening. Welcome to the Glazov Gang. Our tough and streetwise and intellectual gang members this evening are Bill Whittle, conservative commentator, Tommy Trudeau, producer of films and music videos, and back by popular demand, Leon Weinstein, the author of Capitalism 101. He comes from the Soviet Union to warn us that Obama is resurrecting what tormented the people in his former country. Am I correct, Leon? Correct. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Let us introduce our new gang member, Bill Whittle. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Excellent. Hi, Thank you so much. It's an honor and a privilege for you to join the gang. Gentlemen, tell Bill the rule about the Glazoff gang. Well, you can check out any time you like. But you can never leave. <laughs> you can never leave. Okay, thank you very much. Gentlemen, from a little bit of buffoonery and humor to the serious and tragic issues of our time, I think let us begin with this quote-unquote ceasefire uh, in Israel and Gaza with Hamas. And our segment overall is covered with the packaging of the title, Israel versus Hamas. Gentlemen, I think that this is a tragic failure, this quote-unquote ceasefire. Uh, I think that the only time that people are interested, the world and international community is only interested in a ceasefire is when the Jews defend themselves. Otherwise, nobody's, inter nobody's interested in a ceasefire. Uh, I mean when the Jews are being attacked. So I think that the Muslim Brotherhood is being empowered here. Morsi is empowered. Hamas is empowered and legitimized. I think Obama is doing the bidding of the Muslim Brotherhood. I see this as a very bad development because I think the Israelis should have been given a free hand to go into Gaza and dismantle the terrorist infrastructure. Bill Whittle, am I speaking fact or fiction? Well, it's kind of an opinion, but I mean, the, the bottom line is we all know that Israel has the intellectual and the technological capability to eliminate its enemies anytime it wants to. It has the military might, it has the technological might, it probably has 300 plus atomic weapons. What Israel has is capability and they are restrained by their own morality. The enemies of Israel, the second they get capability, they deploy it against Israel. The minute they get any kind of capability, they deploy it against Israel. So you have to really look at this on a moral level. When you, have a, when you have a country that has the capability to utterly destroy its enemies and is restrained only by its own decency, you have to compare that to people who, the minute they get a sharp rock to throw, throw it. This is the fundamental understanding, and this is the thing that is so disturbing about the position of, of the United States government relative to this, and also the position of the Israeli government. When you give the rest of the world the, the opinion that you are no longer willing to defend yourself, your civilization, your people, then they will start taking advantage of that mm -hmm. of that perceived sense of weakness and they'll start pushing and they'll start pushing and they'll start to find out where the boundaries are at which you do begin to respond and they'll start nibbling away at those boundaries and this is what we've seen again and again and again Israel has if you look at the history of Israel in the Middle East they've been the victims of aggression from the beginning even including the invasion of Lebanon which was considered an invasion it was a result of actions taken from Lebanon so they've been the victim all the time they've been portrayed as the aggressor now because they have the technological might of the West because they're a Western country. So people see them with advanced tanks and with, with fighter airplanes and now with things like Iron Dome where they're literally shooting rockets out of the sky. So people have decided to make Israel into the Goliath when they're really the David. Mm -hmm. And the countries, the billions of, of well, billion Muslims that surround Israel, it's a tiny little speck on the map, they're suddenly the poor little Davids to little tiny Israel's Goliath. It's a complete moral inversion of of the actual truth. And Bill, how do you see this ceasefire at the moment, quote unquote, because I think even the rockets continued after the ceasefire, but do you think it's a mistake for the Israelis to allow themselves to be pushed into it? Jamie, the honest answer is I, I don't know enough about Middle Eastern policy or politics to mm -hmm. get to the heart of that issue, but what I can tell you with some clarity is we know that things like ceasefires and, and, and limited responses and incursions, we know that all of these things are this sort of insanity of like measured response, graduated response, right? And this is what's gotten us into all this trouble all around the world. That's why the United States is in the trouble it's in all the way around, around the world. What I mean by that is if you look at the history of the United States, which I know a little bit better militarily, you make a pretty compelling case that the United States has never been fully angry since 1945. Mm -hmm. And everything that we've done militarily since 1945 has been a, a measured, extremely measured, compared to the full extent of our military power. Limited war. Yes. And so the problem with limited war is you have perpetual war. Mm. The way that, the reason that Germany and Japan became 
went from being the mortal enemies to the to the best friends that the United States has economically and politically is mm -hmm. they were utterly defeated utterly defeated in ruins bombed out ruins and then they were helped to their feet by a power that had defeated them and then proved to be benign mm -hmm. there's a powerful combination yeah. but until people are defeated until they until they are defeated they will never really surrender this right. tactic yeah and and we had to utterly defeat the Japanese. People talk about the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It was nothing compared to the fire bombings of Tokyo and Osaka and much, much, much larger areas, utterly flattened. And the same Look thing for Germany. Look at Hamburg and Dresden. Exactly. Those people were beaten. Mm. And once they were beaten, and once it was clear in their head they were beaten, the astonishment of finding that their adversaries yeah. were actually kind and decent people and helped them to their feet yeah. made them perpetual allies. Thank we're you. not going to see anything different in Israel exactly. until something like this and happens. And the tragedy is, is that we even see the Gazans in the street today chanting, emboldened, thinking that they've won this exchange as well. Well, they have. And I think that, you know, they even, you know, I studied American foreign policy. Nixon and Johnson should have done that way earlier when Nixon bombed Haiphong and uh, uh, Harbor. And, the second Nixon, and, the second and Nixon, Hanoi. that's right, the second Nixon bombed Hanoi, the, the, the North Vietnamese they came, came to the peace table instantly. They should have done that much earlier. Leon, you were just in Israel recently. Tell us your uh, view of the events and uh, your perspective on what the conservative commentator is saying. I, first of all, I agree that this is a moral uh, situation, mostly, not military. And the biggest problem is that the uh, so-called Western civilization, our civilization, cannot stomach killing babies. And they're not, they cannot stomach it to the extent that they will stop or try to stop any activity even in activity as retaliation for something terrible that was done to people, in order not to see those babies. We are so, we are becoming so politically correct and, and, and that we are ready to die and we are ready to kill our civilization for that. Look, uh, for Israel there is no good outcome today. Uh, Israelis go inside of Gaza, they kill uh, children. Why they kill children? Because, uh, you know, Muslims, brotherhood, whatever you call them, uh, they go under hospitals, under schools, and, and under kindergartens. Uh, they dig in, in, they put their headquarters, they put their, uh, their weaponry there. Uh, in order to get them, you have to bomb them. You bomb them, you kill children. The, the West will go crazy about it. And that. then the media demonizes and, you. And uh, the media makes you a terrible person, terrible country. At the same time, Israelis as a Western, they're tougher than we are, but they're still uh, Western civilization uh, yeah. people. They cannot stomach killing on their soldiers. So there is no good outcome. It's no, no, uh, I don't know how to get out of it. In other words, the West has to win by being ferocious against a savage ideology and enemy and you don't think we have the stomach which, to, to, which, be, to which do that. Which is almost impossible. Yeah. They, don't have they, they, sorry to interrupt, they don't even have to be ferocious against them. All they have to do is just say the words you just said. They have to say that this is a savage enemy that we're fighting. Yeah. And, and no one's even willing to do that. If you make it clear that you are morally willing to defend the civilization, both of the Israeli government yes. and the American government, you probably don't have to fight them. You simply have to let them know that they mean business. Absolutely. And when they don't hear things like this savage group of people or, or, this, or this barbaric culture, then they get the feeling that they see us, that we think that this is morally equivalent. And if it's morally equivalent, they'll play this game forever. And that what the tragedy is, is we have a hero like Pamela Geller that has some ads now that she's trying to put in, in cities and on subways where she calls the people that killed the Fogel family and that perpetrated 9-11, that that ideology is savage and the people that perpetrate crimes like that are savages and the entire literary, higher literary culture, mainstream media is attacking her instead of promoting that very simple they're, message. They're attacking her so they can show yeah. everybody how morally advanced they are. Yeah. It's unearned moral superiority. It's the coin of a realm of a dying civilization. And all you have to do is see it and call it what it is, and it loses its power. Exactly. This is the problem in our culture. And hey, just happened the other day, again, there was a, uh, there was a, s a bombing against a bus in uh, Tel Aviv, I think, today. The intentional targeting of civilians, whereas when Israelis kill civilians, it is regretfully because they're trying to get at the terrorists and the terrorists are putting kids and innocent civilians in their way. And we have to stress this. Tommy, you have been very nobly and stoically silent. What is your wisdom on this? Well, I believe you're absolutely right. It is a moral issue. And the terrorists, our enemies, the enemies of America and Israel, know that human shields are very effective, especially children. That's why they set their bunkers in hospitals and in kindergartens, because they know 
that Westerners do not have the stomach to kill children. Now, in reality, they have a very barbaric culture where they have a much lesser value on human life. But in a larger sense, in this, in this ceasefire, we have not seen the last of this. There's a reason why Iran provided the more advanced missiles to Hamas, the, the most advanced missiles that Hamas has used so far. They were watching. They wanted to test the capabilities of Iron Dome. They have something up their sleeve. It's not over by a long shot. And I believe that we are going to see some kind of escalation. Hamas has never stood, never kept a ceasefire or any treaty. Um, they will, they will regroup and they will retaliate. It's part of the culture, actually, revenge, an eye for an eye. They won't let this attack by Israel slide. They will seek revenge, and Iran, and Iran will be more involved. And I think also what the media is always overlooking and doesn't discuss, we don't see uh, Anderson Cooper discussing this, we don't see this on MSNBC, who is Hamas, what is Hamas, what is their charter? I mean, their very charter talks about jihad and the commands of Allah uh, and how Muhammad uh, spoke about killing Jews in a war on Jews. They want to annihilate Israel. And I, I just find it incredible that this is never spoken about as if this is some kind of uh, morally equivalent um, group. Bill, let me turn to you. Um, you can answer some of the commentary that has been made, but I want to ask this. Um, the Arab Spring, I think, clearly was not any kind of a spring. Uh, it's an Islamist winner. I think Obama helped unleash it by going over there and giving that speech in Cairo, letting the Muslim Brotherhood sit in the front two rows. This is also Obama's doing, but where are we on the same page that Obama has empowered the Muslim Brotherhood has empowered those forces and the enemies of Israel. That this is very much also, he's complicit in all of this in terms of how much Israel is suffering. Bill? I'll deal with that in just one second, but okay. dealing with uh, what we're just talking about with Hamas, you probably could put an end to all this nonsense. If, if the President of the United States were to say as if he meant it, what an earlier President, what John F. Kennedy said right. with the Cuban Missile Crisis. If the President of the United States came out and said, we consider any attacks on Israel by Hamas to be a direct attack of the Republic of Iran upon the United States of America. Now, if you make that if you make that statement and you make it in such a way that people believe it, in other words, we know that Iran is giving these weapons to Hamas. We know that Hamas is attacking Israel with them. We know that Israel is a close ally of the United States. So therefore, any attack from Hamas upon Israel will be considered an attack upon the United States of America by Iran. The problem would be over. It would be done. You, you would, you would, you would. Well, we get, would have already would, gone to war get, by no, then, no, you right? Would get, you, what you do is, Jamie, you would get rid of this giant kabuki play, this giant mask of disbelief and 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 uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Deniability, right? Mm -hmm. well, you you wouldn't play this game. You wouldn't. You would just cut to the heart of the moral issue. Iran is arming Hamas to attack Israel. Israel is an ally of the United States. So therefore, Iran is attacking the, the national interests of the United States. You simply come out and say what is obviously true, and then all of a sudden all this crap just goes away. Mm -hmm. And then the people who are running the, these attacks out of Iran have to start to realize now that no, now it looks like the West is actually awake, right. and now we have to complicate our, our targeting solution a little bit, because now we won't get away with this with impunity anymore. Right. Now the next time we do this, we're going to have to deal with, we're going to have to deal with stealth bombers and, and 14 carrier battle groups. Mm -hmm. And if you make it stick in such a way as people believe it, this whole proxy war nonsense goes away. We started with this whole thing in Vietnam, by the way, right? The Soviet Union backed the North, the United States backed the South. There was a proxy war. It was a war between the Soviet Union and the United States. Yeah. And if we'd had the moral courage to say, we are fighting for the freedom of South Vietnam and any support given to the North Vietnamese by the Soviet Union will be considered attack on America by the Soviet Union. But Bill, but then therefore if Hamas continues to attack uh, Israel and those rockets have been going, you therefore support that the Am Americans back up their words and that they would attack Iran? Categorically I would, I would do right. that. When I say attack Iran, by the way, I'm not talking about I'm not talking about a full-on invasion like we saw in Iraq. This business of Colin Powell's business of you break it, you buy it, never made any sense to me. Mm -hmm. The United States could pull, could pull Iranian installations off the map with, for just the cost of the money. Mm -hmm. you know, cruise missile attacks launched by submarines, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't lose a hangnail on an American serviceman's arm, mm -hmm. right? So you could simply start escalating this by saying, we're serious, you're going to lose this missile base, you're going to lose this patrol boat, you're going to lose right. this barracks, right? 
Listen, yeah. you don't have to wipe the board clean. Yeah. You make yeah. people convinced that you're serious. And then the problem goes away, Jamie. Yeah. And because they can't play this sophistry game anymore. And how sad, gentlemen, that a person like Bill Whittle is not the Secretary of State or Secretary of Defense advising a president, because I think this sounds like sense to me. The uh, problem is that we are impotent. And uh, I'm not saying it lightly. We are impotent. We cannot do what Bill's suggesting. Uh, we probably will not do even the 10% of that. We are but we should. Should yes, I'm not. Yeah, but you're saying foreign, that the foreign, West and the United States yeah. has lost its willingness to. I think that we lost our political will and and will for life, because instead of doing what Bill is suggesting, we're according to rumors that I heard, we're taking some ships out of the uh, area, moving them temporarily to different locations. Like like our president temporarily went to the Asia instead of being here in Washington or flying immediately to Israel. We, we, we lost what we were. We lost our identity. We're not Americans anymore. And maybe in the second segment we'll talk a little bit about how we can perhaps reclaim that if it is lost, Tommy. And I think the United States is guilty of an even greater um, moral tragedy, and that's our failure to support the brave people. There's hundreds of thousands of brave souls in the Iranian resistance who want to overthrow this regime and the United States has abandoned them, left them to the, the, the whims of these Muslim, radical Muslim lunatics who run the government. And these brave souls are the ones who actually suffer the consequences of of we Americans sticking our heads in the sand. Hey, well, look, we have a supposedly Christian president. I would think that a Christian president would be standing up for the Egyptian cops and the Christians that are suffering. Uh, from no, he has abandoned them. Yeah, he's abandoned them. And we have to end our second segment, but 10, 15 seconds each. Gentlemen, how do you think all of this is going to play out, or do you have a recommendation to the White House, whatever your final words are? 15 seconds each, please, Bill. This sort of low-grade toothache of, of limited conflicts is never going to end mm -hmm. until the civilization that has the, by far the greatest uh, assemblage of might in the history of this world decides to stand up for its principles. It's really not even principles, Jamie. It's a principle. It's one principle. We believe in human freedom, and that's it. Really, you could take the entire policy of the United States down to human freedom. We back human freedom wherever it's being offered. We back Egyptian dissidents. We back dissidents in, in, in Burma. We back dissidents anywhere. If they're fighting for freedom, republic, and a democracy, we're on their side. And if we had an actual sense of our own morality and our own values, our foreign policy would be perfectly consistent. It would be perfectly in line. It would be perfectly predictable. And it would be perfectly inevitable. Absolutely, Bill. And you know, our family, we were so inspired by Ronald Reagan being from the Soviet Union when he stood up for the dissidents that were being persecuted by the Soviet regime. And we just don't see that today. I think dissidents all over the world are disheartened that the White House and Obama do not stand up for them, including Khodorkovsky that's still in prison under Putin and uh, Putin's buddy-buddy with his persecutors. Leon? We're talking about survival, our survival. If we're not going to resist, we will die. It will not end well. It will not end well. You have to understand that in the greater fundamental Islamic culture, when you instill hatred of another race, another part of humanity from infancy, and you nurture that hatred throughout your children's lives into adulthood, the chances for peace are very, very slim. This conflict in the Middle East will not end well. Thank you, gentlemen. Leon and Tommy, you are depressing me and my audience. Maybe Bill Whittle will re-inspire us and give us some optimism in the second segment of the Glazov Gang. Join us then.